My name is James Adlington. I'm a Bristolian born, born and half-bred. I returned to Bristol, Bristol in 1984 after failing as a rock musician and proceeded to start a company called um, Bristol Handmade Glass, HMG of Bristol, Hippies Make Good, Heavy Machine Gun, and um, proceeded to make glass in Bristol and noticed that everything we made in blue sold three times quicker than anything else we made. Well, so it certainly would round here. It's, it's well mm. known. Can you just explain some of the... If, before we hear about why you decided to do glass making, what, 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 how did glass making start in the city? Um, well, back in 1612, James I was on the throne and he decreed that no glass can be used using tree as wood as fuel, save there be a single tree standing on this island. OK, so, so what was happening was wood was being used to make glass and we were running out of wood and they needed it for ships. I yeah, know. most of the deforestation in this um, country was can be laid at the feet of um, the early burgeoning Br- British glass industry. OK, so this 1612, that was well before, well, whatever, a generation before the English Civil War. So whereabouts was it happening here in Bristol, elsewhere? It was happening locally um, up in um, the Forest of Dean and down in Somerset. There was there were, there were glass... Yeah, I mean, do you know what welding means? You know, sticking metal together with... Well, to weld metal. soldering, I know. Yeah. I can, do, I can uh, yeah. solder a, yeah. a plug, maybe. But welding is the word for working in the woods. And the reason why it's called welding is because blacksmiths needed wood to get the heat to make the metal to forge the metal to put them in the middle glass making and metal work were both called welding back in the day okay so how do you make glass what's your raw material how do you make it it's sand basically any sand any sand you can dig the road up actually and make glass out of that if you really wanted to you've heard i mean you must have heard of um um is it revelations in the bible where the whole world turns to glass because it gets so hot. Oh, right. Okay. You can vitrify any, any rocks, any silica. You I can know vitrify there are it. a few islands in the Pacific that have turned to glass after they were n- nuclear weapons mm. tests, I believe. Yeah, yeah, when you look about the Bikini Atoll and all that lot. Yeah, it's actually uh, rather... Um, yeah, there is a conspiracy theory to say that at, um, atom bombs don't really exist, uh, but that's another story. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, talk to the Japanese about that one. Yeah. Uh, so... If, if it started in the 1600s, uh, I mean, that, that, I imagine, would mean that before that, people would have to have holes in their roo- uh, in their houses rather than glass windows. People didn't get glass windows in houses uh, until the latter part of the 19th century. What about churches? Were they churches, doing glass? Churches had glass from... That's the reason why we had glass blown returned. Uh, the Romans made glass and the Romans glazed their houses. So, you know, leaded lights, diamond lights and leaded lights. They're not a medieval creation, they're a Roman creation. Um, the Romans had that. So did it get forgotten about for a while after the it, Romans left? Yeah, the Romans left, yeah, because the Romans, when they, they were here, it wasn't like they were, they were mixing with the Britons. They, they, the, 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 us, the Britons, were seen as subhuman. Um, we weren't as good as them, and they thought we were funny little people who were all right as long as you kept us away from the alcohol and um which sort of sticks to today really like, but um they left and with them um went their their skills and their crafts they they they, they didn't pass their skills and their artist artistry to the local people they kept it to themselves so they didn't mix with us this was a, actually what you're saying is a bit like the medieval guilds is they were very closely guarding mm. the various skills that they had whether they be mm. paper making even or masonry these things were, were kept secret very, like, very, like a sort of cult like trade union in a way well yeah protection Protection. I mean, we do know the name of the first ever glassmaker to come into the country after um, the Romans left. The Romans left in 408 AD, wasn't it, or 412, somewhere around about then. And it wasn't until 11... Well, after the Normans had invaded. Oh, the Normans, yeah, Yeah. after the Normans had been here for, you you know... During the medieval warm period, the beginning of the medieval warm period, Okay, it was when glassmaking first came to 
back to Britain and it was a chap called Lawrence and if you translate his glass into modern parlance it's Lawrence the glass <laughs> <laughs> so what has it attracted you to glass making um as I said earlier on a failed musician um and I I I was an artist is I I I didn't really I was unemployable <laughs> completely I couldn't you know, really go and do a nine-to-five job. I tried it again and again and again, and my I just couldn't cope. The, the mere fact you have to turn up at a certain time and leave at a certain time and have a break at a certain time. I think, I, I'm not going to live my life like that. And so I um, just, just did things. And I worked with metal and glass, and I... Metal and glass, and I... Use glass from skips and things like that, and started bounding them together. And then I found out how somebody, somebody, I'd, I'd actually had learned how to work lead as a sixteen-year-old in just really odd occasions. Somebody told, showed me how to sweat lead, and then I thought, well, I looked at leaded lights and stained glass, and I looked, I thought, well, I could do that, so I could do the lead work. So I started doing the lead work and doing the stained glass. And it just grew from there. And But glass is an absolutely magic material. It does look a bit weird. I mean, have you seen glass blowing? It looks like something a, bit, a little bit surreal about it, actually. Yeah, the, the, there's a lovely thing about glass blowing because um, it's creation. You can be God. Because you start with a puddle. And then you can create whatever you want out of that puddle, whatever your skills will allow you to create out of that puddle. But once you start, you can't stop until you've finished. So there's no going for a fag break halfway to, <laughs> through. Yeah, yeah. You, you, do, you gather your glass, your molten glass on the end of an iron, and, you, and, and there's, there could be World War III starting next door. There could be anything going on, but you are focused 100% on what you're doing. You're living in the moment. You know, it's just like a Zen art. It's like a Zen Buddhism sort of thing going on. And you produce that and you come out with your your finished article, whatever you've made. That's got to get pretty hot, though, isn't it? I mean, wood, surely wood fires don't burn that hot. Is it charcoal you're having to use? Or no, we what, don't. What fuels do you We're use? We're using gas now. OK. Yeah, yeah, gas. I mean, we can't use wood. I mean, the, the earliest glass making in Bristol was using coal. And that's why it turned up to Bristol. That's why Bristol became a glass-making centre. But Bristol was making particularly... Um, it was making bottles, not fine glass, because the sand that they were using came from Redcliffe Caves, and that's red sands because it's Redcliffe, and that red is iron oxide, and that makes green glass. And believe it or not, when you go and buy a bottle of wine today and it comes in a green bottle, the only reason for that is because Redcliffe Caves make green glass and it's just traditional. There's uh, quite a network of caves under there, I believe, isn't there? And that's where they dug out the sand to that's make those? That's where they mined the sand. And it happens to be the largest, most extensive network of caves in an urban environment in the world. It's, I mean, uh, is it ever open to the public? I think maybe occasionally. Is. I mean, I haven't been there for about five or six years, but it used to be a chap called Andy who used to be the curator there. And basically he was sort of like just a, a council employee who got the short straw and told to sit down. You know. And if you shout, you know, go to the gates and shout Andy, and if he's there, he'll let you in. On, on, the, on the QT, that is. <laughs> so <laughs> but don't go in there because you can get, you, you know, you wouldn't go in there because you, you will not find your way out. Because there's, there's only 10% of it that's ever been mapped. So it just goes on and on and on. It goes, and on it goes under Tosser Down, it goes under Bedminster, it goes under the cut, under you know. It, wow, it's it's miles. And, and miles. the thing is, hang on, because you're mining sand effectively. This red sand is yeah. sandstone, I imagine. Yeah, uh, and that isn't going to provide you with a great sort of security above your head, is it? I mean, well, that, it seems to actually. Does it? It, it seems to be absolutely <laughs> you, fine. You know, I've, I've I, been very deep into it actually on a, a couple of occasions. Like, yeah, and yes, it's fine. Uh, sand castles tend to collapse, don't they? I mean, sand yeah, no, but sandstone is is compressed, isn't it? And that's just the stuff that they mine there, is it? Yeah. So, uh, blue, where's the blue come from? We talked about green glass. A blue glass is 
quite a long story, really. Um, there's all pirates involved in everything like that. Um, so I can imagine Bristol Green Glass being uh, something which is well known and celebrated. How come we, Bristol, actually, we Bristol think Green of it as Glass blue? is not well known except in Germany for some reason? I do not <laughs> understand why, but the Germans have a colour called Bristol Green. Right. Yeah. So where does the blue colour come from then? It comes from cobalt, and it comes from basically Bristol. Um, yeah, we had the Merchant Ventures, and we had the port. We still have the Merchant Ventures. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> They're still there. The 40 feet and no. Bristol Merchant Ventures, um, they would sponsor privateers. And the privateers, the ships would go out and they would come back with their plunder. And Pirates? Yes. They were called privateers, but actually they were just out there to... They're bloodthirsty pirates, you yeah. know, cutthroating, murdering pirates. But who weren't, when they got back into Bristol, by the way, they weren't sort of like, oh, arr, arr, and down the pub and go, giving it all that. Blah, blah. They were quite gentrified because they were very wealthy. Mm-hmm. And even the sailors, the reason the Royal Navy never got a foothold in Bristol was because the privateers... They they worked on a percentage, and you could earn quite a good whack being on a privateer. But if you went on one of the, um, you know, the sort of Royal Navy boats and everything like that, you could just uh, Royal Navy boats. You um, you you got a couple of dodgy ships biscuits, a, a flogging, and a shilling. You know, so there was no contest, and um, that's where press gangs came in. Well, they sound sound these privateers sound like sort of gentlemen vandals. Yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah. And, you so, know, okay. So, it, what about this? The blue. How did they? Well, come basically, one of these one of these ships came back with um, a, a couple of porcelain vases from China that came on, and the the actual statement is that the, the two these two porcelain vases, each vase is worth two Bristol houses. Now we're not talking to two up and down in Totterdown or something like that, but we're talking um, a house with seven or eight bedrooms, coach housing, you know, servants' quarters. Grounds and, you know... A uh, nice, tidy merchant's house. Tidy merchant's house, <laughs> yes. And the Bristol... We also had a ceramics industry in Bristol, very good ceramics industry. And they were fascinated with this porcelain, so they wanted to replicate it because it was very valuable. And they thought if they could replicate it, they could make quite a killing on it. So they needed the cobalt to make the the willow pattern type thing that goes on these... the, the, the um, the Ming vases. And so they sent a chap called William Cookworthy down to Cornwall. And he went to a place called Godolphin. And he stayed in Godolphin House, just um, on the Land's End Peninsula. Built a little kiln there just to make um, practices. And you can go and see the... Well, if you get into Godolphin House, you can actually still see the kiln that he built. It's out in the grounds. And um, he, found a, he found a vein of cobalt in a, a mine in St Austell. And he bought the rights for the, the cobalt for the Bristol Merchant Venturers so they could make the blue dye on the porcelain. OK, and... Oh, God, is it, I mean, I don't know how long we've got, but very, very quick story, long, uh, a long story, very short. In 1672, a chap called George Ravenscroft in the glass industry in London, um, by a fact of research and thing, discovered... Clear glass, because clear glass had never been made before 1672. All glass was green, even the clearest stuff. Even the Roman glass. The Romans, the Romans, glass, the Romans never managed clear glass. The Egyptians <laughs> never man- managed clear glass. The Greeks never made glass. Um, the Londoners did it. The London, yeah. George Ravenscroft did it, yeah. He, um, he basically chucked a load of lead at glass because lead didn't actually... They couldn't work out what colour. Every metal gives you a colour. So... If, Gold gives you red, okay. Silver, yellow. And we're talking about those metals being in the sand or being added to the added. sand. You can oh, add okay. it to it. Right. Add it as oxides, as salts, anywhere like that. Manganese gives you purple. There's quite a lot of purple glass came out of Bristol. Iron oxide gives you green. You know, so it goes on like that. Cobalt gives you blue. So he was, he added twenty. He had twenty five percent lead, seventy five percent sand. As a mixture, and came up, he, he came up with the Holy Grail of glass, which was clear glass. And Britain at the time was sort of a real backwater of glass making. 
you know, if you wanted fine glass, you didn't go to Britain. You, you actually went to Venice. Um, the Dutch were pretty good at it and the French were pretty good at it. And the Germans had their, their, um, their glass, which was good, and the Czechs had their glass. So, you know, Britain imported all the fine glass and, you know, sort of like exported virtually nothing. The only thing that was exported in British glass was um, bottles from Bristol. <laughs> There's a book about Bristol glass actually written in 1923 called Lots of Bottle. The only copy I know is in the Bristol Library down by the um, cathedral. So, OK, so what you seem to be implying here is that the cobalt that was going to be used for the porcelain the merchant ventures had got a kind of concession of this cobalt from this mine in Cornwall, yeah. and so they had plenty of cobalt. And so, is that why? Well, what how, happened how we was um, we had um, because um, because we we got this Britain got this clear glass. We went from being the bottom of the pile to the world leaders overnight. Just, wow! Yeah, and so we had all these glassmakers coming into Britain from Europe to work this beautiful new metal. If you're a glassmaker. Okay, and somebody's got a better glass. You will make you will be heaven in hell to get to that place just so you can work the metal. We call it a metal, a molten glass. You call it a metal, and um, you know. So they, we were getting glass makers from Venice. We were getting glass makers from Germany. We get Czech glass makers coming to this country, and so our quality of our glassware went through the roof. And we had something called the Georgian glass explosion, um, which is a term, you know, of suddenly all this wonderful glass started being made in Britain and we became the world leaders. And all coloured glass manufacturing in Britain disappeared. What, even our Bristol glass? No. <laughs> the, the last, the only place where coloured glass was made was Bristol because they were making bottles, green bottles, ten green bottles hanging on the wall. Not blue bottles? No, they what? were making green bottles. Where's this Bristol blue glass? Hang on, hang on, it's a long story, this one. <laughs> OK, all right. And I'm, and I'm making it as quick as possible. A, a glassmaker turned up to Bristol, who probably couldn't speak a word of English, called Lazarus Jacobs from Germany. And he went come to work with beautiful new glass. And he got to Bristol, who had about... We had about four or five glass houses then, making bottles. And he realised that they were just making green bottles. And he wasn't really interested in that. But he set up a shop in temp, 42 Temple Street, just by off Redcliffe Street. And selling high-quality lead crystal glass. He was buying it in from Stourbridge, London, um, St Helens. He was getting it shipped into here, and he was, he, 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 as a merchant, he was a glassmaker, but he was a merchant. And when he got himself established, he married a local girl, he got himself established, and he set up a glassworks, and he imported the, the clean sand, not Bristol sand, he imported clean sand. It wasn't sort of like, um, stuck full of um, iron, so, and he got the lead because we got lead locally as well. And he made he made lead crystal for the first time in Brit Britain, Bristol. And he and that was the, and he called it the non such glassworks, which is I thought was a really sweet name. Anyway, he, the, he, he had a kid, and that kid was called Isaac. You know, blah blah blah. Meanwhile, parallel parallel to this, all this business going on with the um, porcelain with the ceramics industry. When Isaac got to 16, he was a glassmaker. He'd been working on the furnace since he was about eight, apparently. So he was talking to one of the merchant ventures. I don't know the story. Well, of course, I don't know the story because it happened a long time ago. But he got hold of some cobalt and he shoved the cobalt into his dad's furnace, making a clear glass and started making... He, he, next day, the glass was blue. And I don't think it was only the glass that was blue. I and mean, when his dad found out what he'd done, like, you know. but nobody bought coloured glass anymore. Coloured glass, you couldn't go to if you went to uh, you know, the, the 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 really pop rich and the super rich and the posh people would refuse to sit down at a table if there was any coloured glass on it, you know. And so they had to invent something to get the wine from the bottle to the table, and that's called a decanter. So it's no absolute purpose except for um, snobbery. But Isaac had this blue glass and he made a complete table service out of it, a whole table service out of it. I mean, there's a touch of genius here. And, and everybody's saying, that's great, Isaac, what are you going to do with that? Because nobody wants it. And he, and he packed it up, he got it all packed up, crated up, and he sailed with it from Bristol right the way around the south coast of England into, into London and went to St James's Palace and presented it to the king. 
and the king was so pleased to get this and everything like that. He, he had a he had a meal using this glass with Isaac sitting at the table with the king because they could both speak German because that's where the House of Hanover comes into it. And by the following morning, he was the king's own glassmaker. And if blue glass was good enough for the king's table... Well, it's going to filter down through the aristocracy, through the merchants. Well, this is, this is, this is where the genius comes into it that I didn't realise. And I've only found this out very, very recently because we're constantly researching this story because it's not well at thing. But they didn't just carry on making blue glass and selling it willy-nilly down the shops. Like, you know, here's a blue jug, here's a blue thing. They replicated everything they gave to the king. And they would sell. They would only sell the complete collection, and to the re, to the aristocracy who wanted to be as good as the king. Boy, they were good at marketing. Yes, <laughs> boy, were they good at marketing. Yeah, and he became extremely super super rich, and he became it's the latest fad, basically. Yeah, he yeah. became extremely extremely rich. He was very nouveau riche. Um, he basically. Um, you know, lived a fairly high life and he was buried in a pauper's grave because you know, he blew it all. <laughs> and, you know, but the Bristol Blue was born. But they held the monopoly um, for only a very short time. It wasn't long before people, they were making Bristol Blue glass in Stourbridge, they were making Bristol Blue glass in, in St Helens and Newcastle and Glasgow. Um, because they found a, a rich strain of cobalt in Saxony, and that became so cobalt became very, very, very you know, available throughout Europe. So, you, what about the merchant venturers? How are they involved? Did they just finance it? Did they make money out of his success as well? Because the merchants were an interesting force in the city and have been for hundreds of years. Yes, yeah. Were um, they just the money men or what? They were the money men, yeah. And he was made a freeman of the city. Um, Isaac was made a freeman of the city. A lovely name, a, a slight bit of serendipity was his, um, his accountant had the same name as me. Um, a name, it was my namesake, and um, also had the same name wife. And uh, and his, his accountant had the same because they they were both bankrupted at the end, and it's because you couldn't even get it from the court records, and. They went to court because um, he was bankrupt. I mean, how can he be bankrupted selling all this stuff? It might be that maybe the m merchants were involved in that because I wouldn't imagine they'd invest in somebody like him unless they were looking for a decent return. How he how he bank got bankrupt? Thing. He was quite um. He was gambling. <laughs> oh right. Okay. okay. His investments weren't always the most sort of like thing. And the other one was he built a bloody girt house out by Weston. And was going to commute, and there weren't any roads, and there weren't any trains, and there weren't anything like that. And he lost an absolute arm and a leg on this house. So he liked Western Superman. Well, he wanted it, Bristol because Bristol, look, Bristol was a, a, a lovely city, clean city. It was, if you look at some of the tour guides for, for thing in the early seventeenth century, they write they, they wax lyrical about how clean thing because Bristol was the first city ever in Europe to have underground sewers, post-Roman sort of thing. And it was one of the cleanest and the, the air was fresh and everything like that. When, when Isaac um, first coloured this glass blue, there were about f six or seven, we don't know, six or seven glass houses in Bristol. And they're belching coal, not smokeless fuel, just coal. Within seven years, there were 17 glass houses belching. And it became, you know, Polluted. What about uh, the actual process of making glass? It does look as if it's almost a sort of almost I don't know, not a, not a dark art, but it's there's something quite incredible to it. Um, tell me about the temperature. What temperature do you have to get the um, glass up to? Uh, well, what did you say? You call it a metal up to before you can start to manipulate it and do things with it. Well, basically, uh, the furnace is run twenty four hours a day. Um, they come down to 1,100 degrees centigrade um, to work. And at night, um, it's usually yours truly, um, shoveling the glass in th and the cobalt into the, uh, well, the s not glass, sand. Sand, and um, we don't use lead at the moment. Um, we've stopped using lead um, about 
five, six years ago because the Euro- lovely European Union said we couldn't. And, um, but it's, I mean, they're saying that for safety reasons, I imagine. I've been using it for 30 years. Do I look all right to you? <laughs> you yes, I think you're, you're certainly alive and yeah. well, yes. Yeah yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm 60 years old. I, you know, I'm, I'm as fit as a flea. And um, I've been using... Apparently I carry, um, according to a doctor in Brussels, when, when I'm in there, I carry 10 times more lead in my body than they say is safe. <laughs> <laughs> and it's cod's wallop. But um, the... the we we I mix we use a barium mixed glass now, so we have um a, it's about eighty two percent sand and the rest barium and some few other sort of like um so eleven hundred degrees Celsius yeah you shovel it and and we melt it at twelve fifty, so it goes up to twelve fifty at night and we cook it for about <laughs> you cook the sand basically yeah, yeah. you cook the sand yeah because um, you got to vitrify the sand. And then you've got to cool it down to 1,100. Cause so what does that mean, vitrifying? Vitrify is to turn to glass. OK. Right, OK, turn to a liquid. Now, glass is a fascinating material because it's the only material that doesn't fall between gas, liquid or solid. Yeah, uh, everything, everything else. Everything else, like water. We're talking about steam, ice, you yeah, know. Yeah. That's normal, isn't it? Yeah. But yeah. not glass. Not glass, no. Liquid and solid. Yeah. But not gas. Is that not gla- what are you saying? Glass is a solid to touch, but a molecular level, it's a liquid. They they spent a, they spent a lot of these people in white coats running around, and they had big th- things. And in fact, nine years ago, I think now, guys, they came up with the um, the, the phrase "supercooled liquid." Oh, okay. To describe glass, but glass is a magical material. It's absolutely magical. And it's a civilizing thing. Most uh, civilizations, like the, we live in a civilization, although the civilization seems to me, to my eyes, it seems to be crumbling around our very ears. Um, glass was one of the most civilizing factors about things. Can you imagine? It's a material where it cleans easy. You can drink out of it. You can store liquids into it. You can transport things into it. It's a f- wonderful material. OK, that you can do stuff and, and it's and you can produce lots of bottles out of it. You can produce lots of glasses out of it. Yeah. Um, the glass blowing when the, the Romans invented the glass blowing and that was almost the invention of glass blowing was almost a, an industrial revolution equivalent to our industrial revolution in the 18th century. Yeah, um, because it. It civilized it, it brought civilization thing and they could not only could they send their armies out to conquer the world they could send their products and their things and now if you look i've got a lovely book at home now called um pictish glass pictish roman glass which is scottish roman glass and you know hadrian built his wall and they're saying like hadrian built the wall and he kept out they kept out the scots and they were marauding and doing all this lot and everything like that and now they they're sort of like finding um, archaeological digs in Scotland, and there's Roman wares and glass. So, that, uh, you know, the story of the fact that there was a constant war going on between the two is belied by the fact that there's actually a huge trade going on. These aren't sort of like goods that have been captured and stolen by raiding parties. This is trade. Isn't that's how empires work, isn't it? Yes. They, they, they say, come along, knock on the door and say, oh, we, we want to do a bit of trading. Yeah. And then all of a sudden you find that the, they've got their tentacles in. Well, basically, yeah, you buy you buy them. Yeah. You buy them. And that's the Romans did as much with buy, their co- commerce and their enterprise as as much as they did with their armies. OK, well, OK, so there's all the difference in the world between a bottle or a glass and... A flat sheet of glass, which is used to make a window. So, I mean, how do you do that? How do you make a window? Sort of just a nice, flat, perfect sheet or a, or a mirror, that sort of glass. That's very recent. That's post-war. Is it? Yeah, yeah. Um, if you look at mirrors pre-war, and especially pre-First World War, they were, they, were, they were sort of like posh. Posh people had mirrors. And the windows, if you look in the... You go around the houses in Bristol, because Bristol's got, you know, love, lovely old houses and things like that. And you look at... You get into lovely old houses when they've got the original glass in there. That ain't flat. That's all wavy and shimmery. And you look through it and, it, and the light dances. 
and it's beautiful. So you can't blow flat glass, can you? Oh, no. no. How do you... Could you make flat we glass? Can, we can make flat... Not f- perfectly flat glass. No, I can't do that because basically you need to float glass on, on a bed of mercury Ooh. to make flat to make it flat. And that was a... I mean, there was... The, they, they, they got it quite flat in, in the sort of like... Just before the First World War in Edwardian times by drawing glass. By... by literally drawing it up from a pool of glass and as it cooled it thing and, and it's still flexible so it would roll over and so you'd be drawing glass up a virtual constant feed of glass and you'd have a and it but that gives you the beautiful waves i mean that glass drawn and it's called antique drawn is delightful float glass that you go and get for your windows nowadays is i mean it's boring it's flat it's it's dead it's sort of like you know it's so, it, apart from you, does Bristol have a glass industry left nowadays? No. No. It was gone when I got back in 1984. Wow. It was got, it, when 1923, my grandfather worked in the Phoenix Glass Works. Um, where, I mean, I can't remember. I don't know what it's called now. Over by St Mary Redcliffe. You know, they've got the, um, the glass kiln. Yeah. Um, the Landogger Trowel was the... Not the Landogger. What was it called? The, the, um, the, 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 the hotel there. Yeah, he's the one that told me how to make... Um, the, the, he told me the recipe because the recipe for Bristol Blue Glass was lost. <laughs> Who found it? <laughs> um, well, it, basically, I heard the story uh, about how young Isaac made it, and he didn't do it like a scientific thing. Like you know, he he just chucked cobalt into a load of lead crystal. So when we come to reestablish Bristol Blue Glass, we got, I got hold of some lead crystal and we got hold of a little furnace to melt it, and we chucked cobalt and lead crystal together. And we got Bristol Blue Glass. And, you know, that was it, was... it was easy. There was nothing to it. But the lovely thing was Dartington contacted us, Dartington Crystal from down in Tor- Torrington, and they said, um, you've got this um, Bristol Blue Glass going. How did you get the colour? And I said, why? And they said, well, we've been trying for years to get the colour perfect, but we can't get the colour perfect, but we've seen got a piece of your glass here and you've got the colour absolutely perfect and I said well what will you give me for you know, <laughs> yeah well it's a trade secret isn't it yeah yeah what what would you give me you know well, it wasn't going to be a trade secret for long because it was too bloody easy and um so I said what do you give me he said we've got well we've got some glass making equipment and bits and pieces you can have yeah you know, if you if you let us know and I said all right so I hired a seven and a half ton curtain sided van and a yeah, truck and went down there. Actually, it was a 10 ton truck, but I drove it down there. And um, they were putting on all this a kit and stuff. And I'm looking at it and it's getting there. And there's, I mean, I mean, you're talking thousands of pounds worth of kit they're loading onto this van. And I'm sort of thinking, hang on, hang on. I said, you get, calm down here, guys. Calm down. Like, you know, I mean, you know, I've got to tell you how we do it. And uh, the guy said, no, 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 we can't tell you here. We've got to come here, we've got to go into the office. Like, no. I said, all right, OK, I can follow him in the office. And they had these sort of like scientific guys in white coats coming with clipboards and everything. And they were Danish, they were Swedish. They were Swedish sort of like glass technicians. And they said, so, uh, um, Mr. Adlington, can you tell me the recipe that you're getting to make this? And they had a piece of our glass there, like this this beautiful Bristol blue glass. I said, well, do you want the God's honest truth? And they said, yes, we would, we would like the truth. Yeah, I said, well, it's a shovel full of glass and a spoonful of cobalt. And he looked up and he said, well, how big is your spoon? <laughs> I said, well, it depends on the size of the shovel. <laughs> <laughs> they'd been adding, they'd been adding um, manganese, they'd been adding, is it, mag- uh, yeah, manganese, they've been adding magnesium. I get mixed up with manganese and magnesium because um, another story complete. They've been adding manganese, they've been adding gold, they've been adding all these little bits and pieces and, and metals to sort of, like, tweak the colour when all they had to do was chuck a load of cobalt at it. Yeah. So they sound a bit over-engineered. They overcomplicated <laughs> matters. Yeah, but um, they, they were. Uh, I was, they were back then. They were a lovely company, uh, absolutely gorgeous company, and they were really friendly and nice. So they're the only people, pretty much, in this part of the world that are making glass, apart from yourselves, are they? Well, 
we're not really a, a manufacturer in, in, per se, insofar as we, we manufacture. You know, we can't, we make everything completely and utterly by hand. You know, there's no tools and machinery. And so we can only produce a very small amount of glass. So we, we Bristol Blue Glass, you know, outside of five miles outside Bristol, even today, is incredibly rare. Because you, you spread it that far, you know, it, it, you know, the glass goes all over the world. It does. Because um, it gets, we, you know, I mean, we're sending out every day to all over the world. People want to buy our glass from all over the world, but it's still incredibly rare. Um, but one thing we we're really, really proud of, and uh, and the the whole ethos of the company is was around training, because the style of glass making we do, which is Georgian glass blowing, really, had died out completely by the time we started, and there was nobody. Well, there was there was one person alive that actually knew the techniques. And there was only one person alive. And he didn't live very long. He only lived about three months after we found him. And he was very, very keen to share his skills. Um, but it took us years to learn. So we, we, when we first started it, when I, I'd, I'd had blown glass, but I could only blow a few wobbly pots, you know, and I couldn't do anything fancy or anything fine. And so this chap called Ronnie Wilkinson from um, Whitefriars Glass um, White Fires went out in 1973. He he was he was still living in um, Harrow, and we got him out of retirement literally, and took him into um, Long Acre, the London Glass Studio, because they'd gone over to to Los Angeles to have an exhibition, and we were sort of like babysitting their you know their um, furnaces for two weeks. We won't touch. Sounds any. a bit like the steel industry. You yeah. know, there's, I know the big steel works. They have to keep their furnaces going overnight. Yeah. And yeah. if the furnace goes out, then that's all sorts of problems. All sorts of problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. what happens? Sorry to interrupt your story there, but if you, if if you let the thing go cold, what happens? Um. Well, you cross everything and fire it up again. Um, but nine times out of ten, it's a, it's a strip, complete furnace stripped down and rebuilt. Mm, Start from scratch, really. And okay, so anyway, you track this chap down. Track this chap down, and basically, I've still got the notebook now. We we, we work work with him. Lovely. Ch- uh, there's a, there's a glass maker who was because we were the renegades in the glass making industry because you, we didn't go to university, we didn't go to college, and all the glass makers that were independent glass makers in this country were artists, darling, you know. And as a, as somebody said, they couldn't blow their nose, but they <laughs> you know they make a wobbly shape with loads of coloured gl- bits of glass in it, and it'd be their theme, you know, the, the earth thematic, like you know, sort of like um, uh, this is an objet d'art. And and you know, and we say, I say to him, look, can you make me a wine glass? Show me how to make me a wine glass. Like, and they said, why would you want to make a wine glass when I can make one piece of glass and get a thousand pounds for it? And if you'd got a wine glass, you'd have to make a hundred to get a thousand pounds. You know, so, hey, yeah, darling, you've got the wrong idea. Yes, I but um, anyway, um, we got Ronnie out, and we had two weeks working with him. And what do you want, Ronnie, for this? I want a beer. <laughs> And boy, could that bloke drink. <laughs> I mean, mo- most people may know Bristol Blue Glass actually through the sherry, the blue sherry bottles. Was that oh, anything, in, any, in any connection there or not? Yes, I feel very guilty about that, yeah. Because that killed bloody thing. They, I work, look, Br- Harvey's of Bristol was a very, very old Bristol, 300-year-old company, family-owned. 300 years that have been running in the same family, in the same location in Denmark Street. Okay. Well, this is just round the side of the hippodrome. Yeah, yeah. they had um, they had the greatest collection of Georgian glass in the world underneath in the cellars underneath it. I mean, it, absolutely astonishing, and they were absolutely smashing people. And I, they, they, I, I said, said to them, like, you know, you've got this private collection. Can I come and have a look? And they gave me carte blanche to go in there and have a look at all their glass and break because I was pretty good. One thing I, one skill I did have which I'm going to blow my own temple. Um, I, um, I can backwards engineer things quite well. So I was taking these Georgian glasses and working out how, because I, you know, how to backward engineer them, how to make them. And so they would give me, they give me an open thing like to that. And they had some of the original Bristol blue glass made by Isaac Jacobs. 
and I could I could look at that, I could see all that, and they they just gave me open thing. I could go in at any time of the day, any time, and go and see that. They you know what I think's coming here. I know it sounds awful, but that you knock something over and smash something. No, 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 no nothing like that. No, no, no. They they just um came to me and they said they wanted to relaunch the um, Harvest Bristol Cream because th- their worst sherry that they made was called Harvest Bristol Cream. Okay. Um, the, the, you know, they, there's, they had, you know, they, they made, they, they did dozens and dozens of really, really high class sherries. They had connections with Jerez in, um, well, Jerez is in, um, it's in Spain, isn't it? But, um, they were Portu- in Portugal, basically. They had, 300 year old connections between that and that, that those places and they had f- and they were making these wonderful sherries and importing these fantastic sherries and um distributing them throughout the club you know they, most of them went to sort of private gentlemen's clubs and things like that and to the real sort of super rich but they had their hoi polloi sherry which was the bristol cream and they said we want to relaunch it like um and i designed a bottle for tenant water i don't know if anybody's heard of tenant water if you go and watch a hollywood movie and they've got a bottle of water in the set there'll be it, it will be tenant water bottle um i designed that bottle and it won every award known to man for bottle design. It was a bit of a con, really, but um, what I did, I took a Perrier bottle in a wine bottle, a Ricketts bottle, and I morphed between the, t- between the two over five stages, and I took the middle one and said, there you are, there's your bottle. And so it was just a really, you know, it took me ten minutes. And um, I was totally skint at the time. And they said... Uh, Oh, how much do we owe you for this? Or do you do you want a royalty? And I thought, well, nobody's going to bloody buy this. It's not going to. They're not going to make that many bottles. <laughs> and I said, oh, give me 128 quid. And they gave me 128 quid, and that bottle went on to sell by the billion. Oh, <laughs> I could have got not 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 one p off each one. I, I wouldn't be sitting here now if I if I'd have thought of that. But the life's full of things like that. Isn't it? But anyway, because that was so successful, they asked me if I designed them a bottle. And I said, why do you want to design a bottle? I said, why don't you just... And I, we were sitting downstairs and they had racks of sort of 18th and 19th century bottles, racks and racks and racks, all these bottles there. And I just put my hand up like that and over my back of my shoulder and I just got hold of a bottleneck and I pulled it out of the rack and I just stuck it in and I said, what about that one? And that's the bottle they're using. I said, the bottle design they're using. And I said, and just make it out of nickel blue. And they said, why nickel blue? I said, because when you put the sherry in, it's going to look like Bristol blue. And uh, sure enough, it did. And it went off. They, they launched, relaunched it and it went off. Better than anything they could have imagined. It became, you know, it got really, it went bigger than, it became, the brand became bigger than the company. So an American company called Allied Demet. Oh, no, don't. Oh. Yeah. You know where we're going. Suddenly came in... Worse than smashing the glass. Yeah, worse than smashing the glass, came in and said, we're having your company. Now, they went to Bristol City Council. They went to everywhere to help because they they, they weren't super, super rich. They were, you know, they were wealthy, but they weren't mega bucks. So was it it a private company or was it uh, a a hostile takeover? It was a hostile takeover. And what happened was um, they they took over, they trashed everything. They trashed the Georgian glass connection. They just put it up to Bonhams and just sold it off in one day. And most of it went to China and the States and Saudi. And it went left the country. Our heritage was just sold overnight. And so when you, what year was this roughly? Well, this would have been about 96, okay. 97. Right. And... Uh, and Harvey's, I mean, to be quite honest, the, I mean, he was bawling. He was heartbroken, the, the, the Mr. Harvey, the, the, the son that was sort of like there. And he was, you know, this has been in my family for 300 years and on my watch, this, this has happened. And they couldn't do a thing about it. Yeah. So they just bought the company out yeah. and shut it down, eventually. Yeah. yeah, and just took the Harvey's Bristol Cream um, to, and, and it's still going now. 
a brand, just a, a brand, brand, which is part a of brand. a stable of brands. Yes, yeah. a brand. Does anybody want to buy my brand, Bristol Blue Glass? Go on, <laughs> buy my brand. So whereabouts are you? Where are you based? We're based on the Bath Road. Um, that's where we've got the furnaces. OK, so that's opposite HTV, is it? Yeah, or? just down the road from HTV. We're opposite Arnesville, you know, the dead centre of Bristol. <laughs> it's very popular, you know that. People are dying to get there. No. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you have eight, one furnace, two furnaces? Well, We've got, got two furnaces there? running. We have one blue and one clear. Um, and it's most of your business sort of mail order or whatever it's shipped out not mail order well, it's, it's, but, you know it's, you're shipping it's the stuff changing. out it's changing it's changing now the world has changed it's all gone I can't keep up with it no the world's changed like you know, people used to buy objects people used to buy objects and they, they like buying objects now you know but funny enough I mean we, 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 we're just discussing it because we're actually having to sit down and positively view the company because whereas we would before we would just make glass and people would buy it and it go ba 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 and it was very easy because people went to shops and they bought things but where do you go now if you want to go shopping i'm afraid most of it is online now isn't it me too yeah let's go to ebay i went i actually yeah, was uh, looking Amazon. just to buy a jacket for the winter yeah. the other day yeah uh went into a shop there's nothing at all there was nothing that fit me nothing the right st- yeah. size shape the stuff the staff weren't even in the shop you couldn't actually find any staff to help yeah so it's not surprising people are going online yeah you've got people but people have got out the habit of getting, and the generation that's coming up now I mean, I, I mean, don't get me started on the poor, sort of like millennials. Um, and, and I think as, 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 as a 60-year-old man, I think we've failed this generation terribly because, you know, they, they, they've, got no, they've got no chance of buying their own home. They've got no chance. I mean, it's, it's not like, I mean, like what we had. I mean, I, it, I, I, I was sort of... A, I didn't. I didn't get an education. I didn't do anything like that. But that didn't matter because you could be enterprising back back in the day. It's much more difficult for them now. Well, we were talking about in the sixties and seventies, people coming out of school O yeah. levels with yeah. some technical O levels, walking straight into a job in aerospace. Yeah, you know, easily. Yeah, I came out of school with a. I failed. I managed to fail all my CSEs. I couldn't be asked to do them. <laughs> yeah, and. Um, Basically, I, I went out and I, I, I went to the British Telecom and I said, um, I want to become a telephone engineer. They said, you need three O-levels. I said, well, I'm not doing any O-levels. I said, but here, I built this and I built um electronic circuit thing that I'd made up. And they said, OK, give me an IQ test. I pissed it. And um, they, 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 gave me a, they gave me a sort of like a... A, 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 an apprenticeship. So you're now looking at staring this kind of retail failure world in the face and are you, do you think you know your your business will be able to cope with this we've got post we, we're going we're going to have to we're going to have to change um basically people want experiences now they don't want objects mm. so and there are glass makers and the world but the the thing is we've trained people over the last 30 years and the most famous exotic glass makers in britain who are known worldwide came through us so the James Devereux, you know, the David Barrys, all these people who you wouldn't have heard of, but in certain circles, are, their names are, are, are said with reverence and sort of like thing. They came through us. We trained them because we actually learned how to do the Georgian glass making. But the question is, can you survive the death of the high street? Yes, because um, our business is now going to be... I mean, where it was... It was what, two, five, three, four years ago, it was probably about between seven and twelve percent online. At the moment, that online thing's now going. Thing we've got a new website coming on because our our website was oh, it's marvelous. It was in two thousand and four, two thousand and five. Like, but but now it, it, it's clunky and it's old. But we've got a brand new website that we're we developing because any purchases are going to go online. Um. And you ship the stuff all over the world, I guess. It goes all over the world, yeah. Big quantities, small, everything? Every, it's, no, it used to be bigger quantities, but now it's everything. It's individuals, boom, individual pieces going all over the world. And, and every day, every day, the, 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 the van comes and pulls up at four o'clock and takes all the parcels out. 
So we have, you know, so it's a, so we is it completely different. It system. must end up if it's going halfway around the world. Half the stuff must be broken by the time it gets where it's going. I think we've learned how to pack glass. Okay. By now. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> if we hadn't, we might as well go home. Really, haven't we? Really? Yeah. Well, it's good to hear you. You feel like it's all still in a good state for the future. Well, no, you, you, nothing stays still, does it? Nothing stays still, and I mean, the only thing we're certain of in life is death in taxes and a nurse and change um but um change. i mean it does seem that the future is this sort of big mega corporate world and you know the big chains the big big companies yeah but we're we're fighting that from the we're, we're in the trenches we're fighting that from yeah well it, i hope you win that war yeah anyway james adlington thanks very much for joining us Well, that's all for this week, Dialects Bristol's first weekly MP3 podcast. You can download it to listen on your phone or in the car. Suggest interviews, subscribe to our email list, and listen the week before broadcast, if you like, at our website, dialectradio.co.uk. Thanks to our guest this week, James Adlington from Bristol Blue Glass, and to studio engineer Dave Bizanko. Dialects of Bristol Broadband Co-op production. Catch us on Bristol Community FM 93.2 every Tuesday at noon. And anyone can contribute. Contact us through the People's Republic of Stokes Croft, just off Jamaica Street. They're online at prsc.org.uk. And if you have some of your precious time to spare, you can even volunteer with us. But also hundreds of opportunities elsewhere in Britain via the National Volunteering website, do-it.org. So thanks for listening to Dialect. And I'm Tony Gosling, wishing you a very good week. I'll be back on Friday with my two-hour BCFM politics show, live from 6 till 8pm. Meanwhile, till next Tuesday midday, from the Dialect crew, goodbye for now. Goodbye for now.